Bloop a doop a doo. Bloop a doop a da ba boo. Hey everyone out in the. Oh. Sorry. We didn't have interruptions. Welcome, everybody out in the ethers of the internet. Uh, my name is Ramin. I'm Michael. I'm Molly. And today we are talking about some of our favorite albums from the year 1988. Um, 89. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't all listen to all of these albums, uh, but what we did listen to, we, you know, scored like we do our normal album reviews, just in a shorter fashion. We didn't go into quite as much detail because we want to get through this a little bit faster. But um, one person is going to lead discussion on each of these and then the other two are going to respond. What he's saying is I'm not allowed to talk the whole time. Yeah. So Bleach, there's some great stuff on this album, but it's nowhere near as good as any of their upcoming albums. There are some really great hooks on Blue and About a Girl. One thing that I find really interesting about this album is there are two different drummers on it. So Dave Grohl's not in the band yet. But there are two different drummers, and who, depending on who the drummer is, it really changes the feel of the song. Uh, it's most notable on the last track, Downer, which is less grungy and more punk, which is really interesting, actually, in, in, in a way that I really like. There are some songs, actually, they all are in a row. Paper Cuts, Negative Creep, and Scoff are so intense and disturbing that I actually just don't find it at all pleasurable to listen to them. Like, the lyrics are disturbing. And the music supports that feeling, which I get, and it's like artfully done, but it's not pleasurable for me. So I don't listen to those songs. Sorry for all of you who love them. And one thing that I find really interesting about this album is how Love Buzz was Nirvana's first ever single, but it was a cover, <laughs> so, which is sort of a weird thing to do for any band. The standout on this album is definitely about a girl. Uh, but it also feels the least like anything else on this album. It's basically a pop song. Downer is also really fun. The most notable thing to me when I have heard this album is how raw the recording and production of it is. It really sounds kind of garage bandy, which I think works in its favor over some of the more well-known Nirvana albums. Obviously, About a Girl is iconic, and something that we were talking about is how um, they re-recorded it on another album. I can't remember which one. And the version on this album is so gritty, <laughs> and I think is much better. The way that Kurt's voice breaks. Yeah, that's that's what I want from Nirvana uh, when I listen to them. I want it to be grungy, right? What you mentioned about opening with a cover with their first single, I, I think it just shows a label's lack of confidence in the band, right? You know, joke's on them. The albums that only one person reviews tend to be lower because the like individual like minute by the scores tend to be a fairly low score. And if there are two or more people giving their own, like, this is what I feel about it scores, that brings it up more. He's saying we didn't do our homework and it's our fault. Yeah. I was in college and I feel like I listened to this album a lot during those years. And the album was already, what, 12, 13 years old at that point. This was an album that I always put on when I wanted people to think I was cool. <laughs> Now, did I like the album? Yes. Was I totally a poser? Also yes. <laughs> Is authenticity a valuable thing? Also yes. Is being a poser necessarily a terrible thing? Maybe not. <laughs> we all just trying to be cool, and trying to be cool is inherently uncool, but yet we're still all trying to be cool. So, anyway, I would put on this album. I was listening to it this week this morning <laughs> and <laughs> something that struck me is how much each track is really just a groove right the songs are not in a song structure these songs this album is really it's really arty they're doing a lot of weird stuff with guitar sounds making unusual sounds on a guitar and then we got to talk about kim deal on bass which like if you think of pixie songs you think of so many of those do 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 like that's that's cool so many of the lyrics are total nonsense lyrics i think of like slicing up eyeballs oh and well you know my favorite pixies lyric ever and if the devil is six then god is seven like that is everything to me this album sounds like it was recorded 
in the bottom level of an underground parking garage, which honestly is probably the ideal venue if you were ever to see the Pixies. <laughs> I feel like I want it to be gritty. I want it to be Gorilla. Basically, this was the first album that I ever really got into that was like not on a major label, totally underground, totally weird, totally nitty gritty, punk, art punk. There are standout tracks on the album that are like tuneful and accessible, right? You have Here Comes Your Man, which is I think everybody's gateway into this album and to the Pixies, and Wave of Mutilation. We're talking about slicing up eyeballs. We're talking about Waves of Mutilation. It's a weird album. I echo a lot of those thoughts, except for I came into it much later than Molly did. But related to what Molly was saying, I think what makes a Pixie song a Pixie song is a great bass line mm -hmm. and the Good way- deal and the way that Francis and Kim's voices work together. Yeah. There are times that he'll, he's singing higher than her. Mm -hmm. There are times that she's just like barely whispering yes. and he's shouting. Yeah, yeah. it's so good. It, a lot of good stuff. I really like uh, Kim's vocals on I Bleed a lot because they're like, <laughs> because they're like yeah. slightly out of tune. It works really well. Also, I'm sorry, Monkey Gone to Heaven doesn't do it for me. I'm sorry, but you are incorrect. <laughs> the first half of the album, I think, is much stronger than the back half. Yes, I would agree. Uh, my faves are Debaser, Wave of Mutilation, and Here Comes Your Man. This was another thing that I was thinking about when I was listening to the album all the way through this morning. I was thinking about how, well, I really have listened to the front half of the album way more than the back half. Yeah. And, and it fe all feels more familiar to me than the second half of the album where I'm like, oh, I forgot about this song. I know I didn't do my homework, but I did listen to a petit peu of Le Pixie. I don't really listen to like a lot of alt rock or heavy rock or really rock in general. I enjoyed what I listened to from the album. I do hear what you say, Molly, about the sort of groove texture. I can't tell if it's for that reason, or because I'm just generally un less familiar with this genre, that it sort of sounds a little homogenous to me. I mean, some songs do stick out, but that doesn't necessarily make it bad. But there are little differences in here and there in what they do that you can hear are pushing on and leading on into what we heard in the 90s more from rock. Like what you said about the experimentation with the guitars or the vocals, which helped keep it fresh for me. You can hear the 90s coming. Yes, exactly. That's what I'm trying to say in many more words. I want to define what I mean when I say, refer to a groove as opposed to a song. When I say a song, I'm thinking of a piece of music that has a verse, chorus, verse, bridge, chorus, chorus, you know, kind of right. structure. Um, and when I say groove, I mean, you're feeling a beat, you're feeling a bass line, you're feeling a guitar riff, and it's not really about that verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus thing. It's really just about feeling the groove. Again, this is largely because this is such a front heavy album on what's good, but the songs that are good on this album are really good. It's a pleasurable listen. Like I'm not gonna turn it off, but it's not really the first thing I'm jumping to when I need something to listen to. Does it make you feel cool, Ramin, to be a person who listens to this album? This is not an album I ever would have been allowed to listen to at my house. Like mm -hmm. something people don't get about me because I'm mixed heritage. They think that like my house was this cool, hippie, progressive, liberal place, man. And it was actually like pretty that. conservative. I guess it does sort of make me feel cool, but I also grew up in a very mixed neighborhood where like cool wasn't necessarily uh, I'm sorry to be a little crass here, but cool necessarily wasn't just what the alt-white kids are listening to. I gotta say, this is the first time I've ever heard anybody describe a Pixies album as pleasurable. Very pleasant <laughs> to the ear. <laughs> it's a toe tapper. <laughs> <laughs> so the Sugar Cubes is the band that Bjork was in before her solo, well, sort of before and after her solo career because she did have one solo album before them. But this is the Sugar Cubes' second album and their first album is just so much fun all the way through. This album is a little bit less so, but the songs on this album are at their best when they're faster. And when there's more Bjork and less of the other vocalist, Einar, Einar even like approaches Icelandic rap in the song Regina, and it's not a good 
thing. A lot of the uh, Sugar Cube's most fun songs feel like they're heavily influenced by Prince and David Bowie and the B-52s. All good things. My faves on the album are Speed is the Key, Dream TV, and Nail. I like that it's tuneful, but still experimental. But what I really want to know is, if Bjork is the Beyonce, then who's the Kelly and the Michelle? It's like the lowest score he's ever given. Yeah. <laughs> I can't think of a music that Michael doesn't give a high score just for being music, and he likes music so much. <laughs> Part of it for this one is almost that it's like disappointing because we know that they could be so good, mm -hmm. and this one just doesn't quite live up. But it's also sort of that like sophomore album thing. Oh, yeah. That because is a thing. A, a lot of bands have worked for years to create a great first album, and then the, the label tells them, okay, we need another, another one in a year. A lot of Sugar Cube's songs, you can really hear Bjork's songwriting in them. Like, if you look at her lyrics, there's one on this album that she's singing about a sexy bee. <laughs> As in the insect? Yes. Very Bjork. Um, that is very Bjork sentiment. And gosh, her vocals are just so good all the time. There's a weird motif throughout Bjork's career of like, wanting to fuck nature. <laughs> Don't you mean? <laughs> Say no. <laughs> Wouldn't kick nature out of bed. One of my top 10 favorite albums in my little gay childhood. Looking back on it now, it's not as good as I thought it was, which is true of a lot of things that a lot of us liked in our childhood and we look back on, right? Uh, but I do really, really still love this album and it's probably my favorite or second favorite Madonna album. What I really love about this album, I mean, the singles are fantastic, right? And pretty undeniably so. Like, I don't really know anybody who doesn't like Like a Prayer unless they're like against pop music in general. I don't really know anybody who doesn't like Cherish. It's like musical joy embodied, the embodiment of musical joy. I also like that to me at least, and maybe this is just a function of where I was in my life when I listened to this, but to me, there is this kind of subtle narrative through line in the album. You know, you have this immediate inciting incident of like religious turmoil with like a prayer and then romantic turmoil with the next couple of tracks, like the Prince track, which I don't love. The Prince track I think is one of the weakest on the album personally, but it's a narrative through line that then leads to like crises in childhood with Dear Jesse, which I also don't love, but which is a great setup for Oh Father. And then from there, it continues with like keep it together and reconciling with the family. I love the last track where she goes, what do you mean it's not in the computer? I just think it's so clever and stupid. Um, yeah, there are a couple duds, like I said. Spanish Eyes, I think would be better in someone else's voice but I don't think it's a bad song. Like I would love to hear like a Pat Benatar sing that song. I just have such love for this album. It's really hard for me to be unbiased. Come on girls, do you believe in love? Cause I got something to say about it. The Prince track sounds like such a Prince track. I don't want ballads from Madonna, except for Oh Father, <laughs> uh, which is the one ballad that I will accept from her. I feel like it's partly because the way she sings it, it feels very much in part of her persona, right? Of this like high drama, uh, imposing presence. Well, yeah, and that's another thing. I think on this album generally, I think that this is the best Madonna ever sounded vocally. And I think we don't think of Madonna as a singer's singer. We think of her as a pop star and um, I could go on and on about the difference between those two things, but singing was never her strongest thing. And I think her singing is really quite good on this album, especially on Like a Prayer and Cherish, really. Her singing is really good on Cherish. So I think this is a fun album, but I think it falls into the trap that a lot of pop albums do, which is that the singles are great and the rest is just filler and I don't want filler. And so uh, generally with pop music, I do just seek out the singles and I skip the album. Not every really talented artist is great at making an album. And there are some albums that are better than the sum of their parts. I think Madonna is more the first camp than the second. So I wanted to go into a little bit more detail on Prince because he has like a pretty big thumbprint on this album. Um, he plays the guitar in the opening of Like a Prayer. 
Uh, he also plays the guitar on another track or two. He plays on Keep It Together, and he plays on Act of Contrition. Would uh, you, not to interrupt, but would you say that Madonna was one of Prince's protégés? No. Okay. Also, apparently they butted heads a lot. Um, she butted heads with a lot of people. They are, were both such... Headstrong. S- headstrong, like very confident in their own vision, musicians. Yeah. And I could imagine someone whose vision doesn't necessarily exactly match yours, you're going to butt heads. Like me and Michael. <laughs> yeah, we fight all the time. <laughs> so do we just give all the albums the exact same score without realizing it? Yeah, I wanted to say that I, I think it's funny that Express Yourself is sort of an anti-material girl. Mm. Express Yourself is like, don't worry about the things, worry about the time you spend with him. And Material Girl is like, I like the things. <laughs> material Girl is about using men to get things, and yeah. Express Yourself is about actually having a fulfilling relationship it's growth i guess yeah (laughs) what i love about express yourself is it's still that like aggressive madonna messaging it's not like you know a lot of light rock songs you hear about the same motif of like make sure you stand by your man and love him and squeeze him and hold him close you know it's like Fuck that. If he's not emotionally fulfilling you, don't stand for that shit. Well, uh, yeah, she says, demand what you want out of a relationship. And if you're not getting it, it's time to move on, you know? And I think that that, in 1989, was um, a revolutionary thing to say to women, right? I do not love Dear Jesse, but apparently it's the only Madonna song that has a meter change. I think Till Death Do Us Part is a little underrated. The guitar part in that is yes. really fun. <laughs> I really like Till Death Do Us Part, yeah. That's about Sean Penn. I think something other than death did them part. <laughs> well, the song is about the, their divorce, so oh. yeah. So to differ with the two of you a little bit on uh, Oh Father, I think Oh Father is a really good song. I don't really love Madonna's vocal performance on it. A little bit more about Pray for Spanish Eyes. Apparently the earliest pressings of the album also came with AIDS safety information pamphlets packed into the album as a a tie-in to Pray for Spanish Eyes, which I think is really, really cool. Madonna, like, really doesn't get enough accolades for being a gay icon before it was really a thing. Madonna, like, came up through the gay club system. She was still playing those gay clubs. Like even late in her career, she went to the hole in the wall gay clubs and performed. Like she has always been by the gays. It's a, an album for the singles mostly. Yeah, I mean, if we were to take the singles yeah. alone, it would get an A, right? Yeah. Okay, so let's move on to something that is completely different. This album is probably in my top 20 albums of all time. The production is immaculate. The percussion is so intricate throughout this album. I mean, it's pretty standard for how industrial music works, but this is like a really, really good example of industrial music. So many songs on this album flow into each other so beautifully, except for when they intentionally don't. There are a couple tracks that like, you're just like in this mood for a couple tracks and then it's just like abrupt cut. There's no space between songs. You get into the next one. It's so really artfully put together. Like sequencing on an album is more important than we talk about. At first glance, a lot of these songs can come across as sort of like angry, whiny, incel guy. But if you really get into the meaning behind the songs, a lot of the times when he's singing about love or sex, he is not actually meaning to talk about love or sex. He's actually talking about his drug addiction. A lot of the songs like Something I Can Never Have, which sound like he's whining for something that he doesn't have. It doesn't come from a place of like, I deserve this. It comes from a place, I know I'm not good enough for this. So it's a little bit different than like the typical incel thing, because incel culture is like, I deserve this. (laughs) Entitled into some like individual tracks i love had like a hole for being such an anti-capitalist anti-god song it's it's bow down before the one you serve i love that yeah, hook. it's yeah. such a good hook the white boy rap in down in it doesn't really hold up but i still know every word would you like to recite it no, for us right now I would please not. please I would, no. please something i can never have is one of my favorite songs of all time full stop it's it's like the song that i always have to listen to almost uncomfortably loud in my car and shout sing along with it. I witnessed him doing this once. And I hear a lot of people talking about how this album is sort of a ripoff of a Skinny Puppy album, and I don't know Skinny Puppy, but I do want to say that that's sort of like part of why I think this album's really good, because people do know this album, and this sort of brought industrial music to other people, and it was a huge influence on so many other musicians like Tori Amos, who even sings a song about Pretty Hate Machine. Even if they weren't the ones inventing this, I think they did it really well. Well, 
they. At this point, it's only Trent. I think he did it really well, and it's just an excellent album. Um, I've only, again, listened to a few tracks, not the whole album, partly because, and I'm, as we're talking about this, it's easier for me to articulate why it's hard for me to listen fully to like the Pixies or to this album. When I listen to music, especially for the first time, I tend to absorb the, the emotional quality of it and really hold it in me for a really long time, like sometimes an entire day. And I love the overall texture and feel of this music. I love the sort of industrial quality, but the fact that it's not just noise, which a lot of industrial 80s music can sometimes feel like, right? There's a clear song structure, there's a clear tune and all that. I want to listen to the album after what you've said, like in full, but I need to find like a good time when I have the capacity in me emotionally to absorb that and hold it in me like I tend to do. When I think of industrial music, this is sort of the poster child for that. So I think it's it's pretty iconic. Even as much as I was saying about like <laughs> how these songs don't mean what they seem like at first glance, it is still, it's coming from a dark place. Um, it's coming from intense depression and problems with drug abuse. So it's, it's definitely not an easy listen. My turn to lead again and talk about one of my patron divas. Before we get to the score of this album, it's a little teaser for the end. It hurts me so much that this album ends up having a low score, but it's because of a lot of the things we've been talking about, because I was the only one who actually gave it scores. But also it's, uh, this is another album where the singles are just so much stronger than everything that's not a single. This album is like one big love letter to New Jack Swing. Um, so much of this album is New Jack Swing. And I love how Rhythm Nation is sort of just like a thesis statement for the album right at the beginning. Like, this is what you're getting in this album. And a lot of it is very socially conscious and you get that industrial sounding New Jack Swing that is the sound of the album. Mm -hmm. The next two songs, State of the World and The Knowledge, feel like the same thing with diminishing results. Rhythm Nation is so good. And then State of the World is like, oh, this is still good. And then The Knowledge is like, oh, we're still doing this. Like, it's not bad, but... Miss You Much is apparently Janet's best performing single of all time, which is interesting because I would never count that as one of her best songs. It's it's not a bad song, again. Um, but like Rhythm Nation and Escapade on this album are miles better. Also, Love Will Never Do Without You was supposed to be a duet with a male singer. They never officially said who the male singer was supposed to be. It's rumored that it was Prince and it didn't work out. Janet sang both parts in the demo while they were in talks with said male singer. She sings like the male parts lower in her range and quieter after the whoever it was fell through. They're like, oh, she sounds really good on both of these parts. Let's just have her do it. <laughs> I hate to interrupt, but Janet Jackson is just so criminally underrated as a musician, as a performer. Like if she were white, she would be constant number ones throughout her whole career. Like it's just, it, it makes me all, it's so mad. It makes me so mad because well, she's so good. And not to continue to interrupt Michael, but I think during this <laughs> time period, you still had a very segregated radio, right? Like you had pop was white and R&B was black. And Janet at this time would have been, I mean, she probably crossed over into pop a little bit, but she probably was played a lot more on the R&B stations. When if anything, I would call her more pop than R&B throughout her career, really. Escapade is up there with my top favorite Janet songs. Like my favorite part of the song, when she goes, Minneapolis, come on. <laughs> it's so <laughs> funny, <laughs> but also it's great. But also, that's that's a large reason why people think that the man who was supposed to be in the other song was Prince because they recorded in Minneapolis and Minneapolis was a hub for New Jack Swing. Black Cat is the only song on the album that Janet has no co-writers on. She wrote it all by herself. I love the rock edge on Black Cat and it almost sounds like it's like opening the door for En Vogue later. <laughs> Overall, the album is incredibly cohesive, but at times to its detriment, like sometimes it's too samey. But all of the, the songs and all of the sounds on this album are iconic. Like if if there was some hidden track that, that they didn't release from the album and they stripped the vocals and they just like played this track without vocals for anyone, they'd be like, oh, that sounds like it belongs on Rhythm Nation. All of this sounds like it fits together so well. I, I mean, I love this album. I love... All Janet. This album is just, it's just like 
non-stop bops for the most part. I mean, yes, there are some duds, but like just the energy of this album and also to her credit, you know, Janet has always pushed doors in terms of the topics of her songs too, right? And her lyrics. Janet was really, and still pushing the envelope. I mean, she talked so explicitly about sex, AIDS, racial issues, like this album especially, but also Velvet Rope, other albums come to mind. There's really not a topic that she doesn't touch. Yeah. And meaningfully, too. It's never just like a, you know, wouldn't it be great if the world were less racist, man? No, it's like really exploring, for as much as a pop song can do, really exploring those issues. And I just, utmost respect, my queen. Rhythm Nation is obviously like one of the greatest pop tracks ever. Oh, sensual world. Um, I love this Kate Bush album so much. Although I respect things like Wuthering Heights and the more experimental Kate Bush sounds, which are still somewhat present on this album, I really need a good tune. I'm sorry, I need something to grab onto. I always sort of cringe a little when I see an album automatically named after one of the tracks because very frequently they just name it after the most famous single, right? So that you'll buy the album. But this really is an apt name for this album. All the music just feels sensory and textured in really tangible ways. Even tracks I don't care for so much like Fog I still have that like ethereal sound that, to them. I love this album and I love it more listening back to it on repeat. And that's really not something I can say for most albums in my life. So I'm gonna get some looks for this one. I've never really been a fan of this woman's work. It's never really done it for me, but I listened to it the other day and maybe it's because I am recovering from COVID. Maybe it's because of, you know, the emotional place of the nation, but it really hit me in a way it's never hit me before. Her songwriting is just unparalleled. And I like that there are moments that feel a little bit 80s tropey, but still feel like her moments, like uh, feels like a more typical 80s song than a lot of the other songs on this, but it still feels distinctly Kate Bush. I know we make fun of her little, you know, idioms, like her vibrato and, and you know, uh, some of the vocal gestures she uses, but the title track is just so delicious. The, the song, The Central World, was supposed to be a text set from James Joyce's Ulysses, which is why the lyrics sort of make no sense. She couldn't get the rights to Ulysses, so she wrote something in the same style. It does sound like the sort of like stream of consciousness uh, writing that Joyce uses in that. And I also really love the formless feeling of the song, which suits the lyrics and um, suits Ulysses, but it's almost kind of hard to tell how irregular all of the lengths of phrases and things are in that song, unless you're really paying attention. Like if you're not paying attention, then it just sort of like flows over you and it's like, oh, this is cool. And then if you're paying attention, it's like, oh no, this is really cool. <laughs> love and Anger sounds like it could be on Hounds of Love and that's not a bad thing, but it would be sort of a middling song compared to the rest of Hounds of Love, which is my favorite Kate Bush. But I do think her crescendo on, cause it's so deep you don't think that you can't speak of, it's like, whoa. <laughs> that was one of my favorite parts on the album. And it was Kate's only number one US Billboard hit on the alternative rock, uh, not, not, all, not overall. The Fog is also not one of my favorite songs, but I love how the flute stop organ synth and the acoustic whistles work together. And her flutterando on just put your <laughs> Heads We're Dancing. Okay, so it is W E apostrophe R E, Heads We Are Dancing. Um, oh, I didn't yeah. know that. Flip a coin. Yep, because, okay. because that's that's what the song's about. It, it imagines a person, it, because uh, this, this person walks up to her and says, like, hey, we're gonna flip a coin, heads we're dancing, tails we're not. She agrees to it and then it's heads and they dance and then she gets home the next day and reads the newspaper and sees this man's photo in his newspaper and it's Hitler. <laughs> she knew who he was by name but not by sight and then she figures out the next day that she had danced with Hitler and she doesn't know what to do with her, with her feelings so all she can do is laugh. And I feel like that is a really like what do you do? <laughs> what a weird premise for a story in song form. 
It's, I love that we've talked about the Pixies, Nirvana, Nine Inch Nails, but this, this is what's too weird for Molly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's okay. It's very strange to me. You no, know, it, it, it's weird. It it's very Kate Bush. My favorite songs on the album are Rocket's Tale and This Woman's Work. So Rocket's Tale, basically the premise is, in the lyrics is like, I don't like this thing that you like, but... I'm going to do this for you to make you like me more, even though it literally kills me. Do you notice me now type of thing? Um, mm. Like, big fucking mood. Um, I love the wailing Bulgarian women's chorus in the song. Um, yes. That's very Kate Bush. And uh, then paired with the over-the-top, campy, cheesy David Gilmore of Pink Floyd guitar solo. And then this woman's work. This is one of those songs that I think if I ever write something half this good, I'll be happy. The the last chorus, which has her, again, wailing background vocals and the best Achelle Rondo in all of pop music. Um, it's just like, it, you feel the intensity building. It's like, ah, 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 ah. And her vocal performance is so good on that song. Kate seems to not know how to end albums. I feel like her second to last song on albums is always really, really good and like such a moment. And then the last song is just like, okay, here's the end. <laughs> That's very much the case here. Walk straight down the middle. It's just like, I also love how um, she makes the album cohesive by using certain sounds, instruments, whatnot in several different songs in different contexts, like the wailing Bulgarian women's chorus is in a couple different tracks used in different ways. The sort of Celtic flutes and whistles that she uses are not through the whole album, but just in different spots. The Bulgarian chorus and the Celtic pipes come together really well in Never Be Mine, which is underrated Kate Bush song, I think. Some excellent text setting in that song. I just love the casual way in which you just said the Bulgarian chorus and <laughs> Celtic pipes came together really nicely. <laughs> I just wanted to add one little thing because I agree with you about pretty much every track you said, but deeper understanding, listening back now in 2022, it is haunting how prescient it is about how we are tied to computers as if they are our real best friends. And not just lyrically, but musically too. It starts with a little bit of those electronic sounds, but they sort of gradually crescendo and take over the song to the point where like the lyrics start to mesh and mash with, with them. And in the end, she's just talking, singing in binary lyrics as these coding sounds overtake the texture. It's just so powerful to listen to in hindsight. I realized as I was listening to you and Ramin talk about Kate Bush that I could never be a very good, like, actual music journalist because I don't want to listen to music I don't want to listen to. <laughs> Dolly Parton's White Limousine, spelled L-I-M-O-Z-E-E-N. This is her big country comeback after the 1987 flop pop crossover album Rainbow, which was a critical and public failure. So she comes back with White Limousine and just bursts out of the gate with an excellent country album. Dolly doing what Dolly does best. And one of the things that Dolly does best is taking mediocre, schmaltzy pop rock songs and turning them into excellent country songs, <laughs> which she does with Ario Speedwagon's Time For Me To Fly, which is the opening track on this album. It is so fun. <laughs> <laughs> the lead single from this album is Why'd You Come In Here Looking Like That, which is, I think, a quintessential Nashville modern country song, which is to say that a lot of the pop country Nashville music that is sort of characteristic of country radio that we music heads all love to hate is trying to sound like this song, which is to say this song is what it should sound like and all those other songs are cheap imitations. This album is produced by a uh, bluegrass legend, Ricky Skaggs. He also plays the mandolin on this album. He was known as a mandolin uh, chopper, picker, and this is actually his first album as a producer, first of many. This album finishes with the completely 
insane camp classic, He's Alive, Sweet Jesus, which tells the story of the Easter miracle from the point of view of, I guess, one of the disciples who's like, and she came and she said that the stone was rolled away and the body was gone. So we all ran to see. And then like a chorus comes in. There's like trumpets. It's a whole thing. If you have not heard this song, you have to listen to it. It is bananas. So your faves are all the same as my faves. Um, Time for Me to Fly, Why'd You Come Here Looking Like That, and He's Alive are the obvious standouts, I think. I I didn't know until this morning when Molly showed up at my place that Time for Me to Fly was a cover because my note for that song was a lesser artist would have made this slower and more emotional and would have made the vocals soar more, which is exactly what REO Speedwagon did when they wrote it. (laughs) It's really cheesy and corny and Dolly makes it into just like an upbeat, fun country song, you know, honky tonk song. Yellow Roses, I think, is an interesting song in that it sounds like a Dolly and Porter song, Mm -hmm. complete with the earnestly spoken verse. Yeah. I don't love the song in general, but I do really like how you don't know immediately that it's a sad song until you get to the first chorus. Like the first verse sounds like, oh, this is a pleasant, like, I love my husband type thing. It's like, oh, he left me. Okay. (laughs) It's a country song. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, and I just have to remember, because I didn't mention it, um, and I guess my notes were not that organized, the duet that she does. That is like sexy Dolly. Like, oh my goodness. I'm scandalized. Wait till I get you home because I'm going to, you know, do things to you that I'm not going to talk about in public. And everything you say about like her musical talent, especially for this time of her life, is totally valid and on point. I've always been impressed by her ability to navigate her voice. And I just love that she is really one of the last of a dying breed of like what I consider authentic country music. To me, a lot of modern country you hear on the radio is just pop music with a country accent and a guitar. But Dolly, you can't say that about. I mean, it's just so authentic and delicious. You know, she's the last of that generation, but I think that it skipped a generation and now you have a new generation of people who are keeping that sound going into the future. And it is interesting because I do think that there are tracks on here that sound like that modern pop music that has a a country accent, but that are more solidly rooted in the country sound. And I think Ricky Skaggs has a lot to do with that because he was a bluegrass guy. Such strong foundation in country music playing technique. You know, the slide guitars, the steel guitars, the banjos and mandolins and fiddles rather than just, like you said, playing a rock song, a pop rock song with a, with a little bit of a fiddle line over top of it and calling it a country song. Yeah. And you have Dolly. She has managed to sound the same throughout her entire career. I don't know what drugs she's taking to preserve <laughs> her voice, but it's, it's just phenomenal. And like, I wish we could all do that. And it probably ha- has a lot to do with her singing technique, which, you know, she's known for that sweetness in her voice. It's funny because this is not really known as like one of the big Dolly albums, but really, I mean, Time For Me To Fly and Why'd You Come In Here Looking Like That? Like I would put those in my regular rotation <laughs> of music that I want to listen to because they're so good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so those are all the albums that we wanted to cover. And I I should have said this at the beginning. We're sort of treating 89 a little differently than we have 85 through 88 in that those videos where we're just doing everything ended up being too long and we end up sort of like skipping over some thoughts at the end and like being too tired to finish filming and stuff like that. And I interrupt Michael too much and he gets mad at me. (laughs) So we're trying to get out this time that we're going to sort of break everything up. So we're going to do this albums of 89, focusing on the ones that we might have spent a lot of time talking about in the music section of the 89 video. But then we'll do a separate TV video, a separate movies video, a separate music video. And we'll still reference these things that we talked about, but sort of like in context of all of the music instead. Oh, and a separate video games video so that they'll be in smaller chunks. It'll be easier for me to edit so it won't like crash my computer every time. And it'll be hopefully a little bit more closer to bite size to watch, but also we don't have to stop ourselves from saying things we want to say because we can go longer if we need to. How would y'all feel about like starting a podcast together? I would love an audio only format so I don't have to get in the hair and makeup every time we do this. <laughs> I mean this essentially is a podcast already. Yeah that's why I'm saying and it probably would be easier to edit. Every time we do it. <laughs> I would be open to it but we could also just do a different cut of the same thing 
as a podcast. I like also having video because I do put images on the screen when we're talking about certain things and stuff like that. I'm not opposed, but would our three viewers be interested in a podcast instead? <laughs> Leave Sound it off in the, the comments. comments. <laughs> Maybe we'll get a hundred percent saying yes. So one comment saying yes. <laughs> Hey, Editing Michael here. It has come to my attention that we didn't film an outro for this video, so I just wanted to say thank you for watching. Give us a like, follow our channel, give us a comment or two, let us know what you think, and we will see you next time. Maintain your groovy selves.